Our next speaker is Eric Eicher, former intrusion forensic team managed for J.P. Morgan Chase with a 13-year law enforcement background. We would like to introduce the senior incident response consultant for Cisco Advisory Service, Eric Eicher. These guys have been, uh, been pretty awesome so far. Uh, you have brought my 12 year old son with me, mainly as defense against you guys heckling me, but uh, also <laughs> even over picking locks and uh, doing his first B side. So she really went through a whole lot of who I am, but uh, yeah, who I am is uh, in response analyst for Cisco, uh, doing consulting work with uh, with customers that do disk memory network forensic stuff and responder briefs for that. Uh, you have three years at J.P. Morgan Chase as the uh, intrusion uh, forensics team manager there, and uh, doing computer crime digital forensics investigations for law enforcement for 13 years before that. And so, what we're going to go through today is just an evolution of electronic extortion, its roots to regular extortion, how everything changes and nothing really ever changes, right? That's, that's a, a lot of what you see. Um, we got to talk about ransomware a little bit, and then we're going to go through. Uh, DDoS extortion, other things like that, and using some threat intelligence to make sure that uh, you at least are one step ahead of your of your threats as well as you can be. So, um, extortion defined right? Uh, it's just obtaining something, especially money for your your threats. Back in the first original days of extortion, you had a bunch of big monsters come in and shake you down, try to break your legs if you didn't give them money, and you knew exactly what your threat was, how viable it was to be carried out, and what was going to happen if you didn't. Uh, comply with the threat, right? Um, they, had a, they had a great market model going on. The problem was back then, attribution of your threat was a lot simpler. You knew who the gangsters were that broke your legs, who you had to pay. Law enforcement started dealing with them, and uh, it got us into a lot more of what we have going on now. But, like everything changes and nothing ever changes, the, the first, uh, first parts of an electronic extortion were just like old extortion. The old mafia extortion, all the way back in 2007 was the first uh, example you see of the FBI putting out uh, a warning about this little threat you see up here, just threatening to come kill you if you don't give them $20,000. And uh, it was super old school. They wanted it wired into their Swift account. Um, you know, Swift extortion is a whole new thing now, and that's pretty awesome and in the news. But they wanted they wanted you to wire them $20,000. You know, fast forward a few years, and some of the first DDoS extortion things really showed their their mafia extortion roots. It was a it's a whole protection racket, right? Um, you know, a little show of force. I do a little small DDoS, bring it down to your knees for a couple minutes, or or make sure your server's not responsive, and then say, "Hey, I'm going to really come shut you down if you don't pay me, pay up." And hey, you know what? I'm going to keep bad guys from being able to DDoS anymore. I'll keep you safe if you just pay me. You know, nothing bad will happen. Uh, just, just like yeah, just like all the good white cat movies, right? Um, so you know, there's uh, a lot of the uh, um, our, our modern collective and, and uh, DDoS with Bitcoin groups and things like that. And uh, see, this is a you know play into some things we're talking about a little bit later, knowing what your threat is. You know, the Department of Homeland Security put out a um, advisory saying, hey. I'm already collecting some of these other groups. They're saying they're, they're doing a limited DDoS attack. And they're doing a little show of force, and then they're demanding money. This is how it all works. These are your TTPs of this record, if you will. This is how they're carrying everything out, right? Um, and then you have some other uh, pretty popular DDoS groups going on. The Lizard Squad was sitting there, and they're, they're throwing their stuff on Twitter. They're saying, hey, we just did this small DDoS against you, Blizzard, or you, Sony. And if you don't pay us, we're gonna we're gonna come shut you down. Or they're just shooting back at some of the old groups, but they're communicating over Twitter, so it's a little more public than just sending an email, right? So all things old or new again. The the uh, a, a big uh, international group, Interpol, and uh, you know things like our FBI here and and equivalent over in other countries. Busted DD for BC and Armada Collective got them all in jail in early 2016, right? But what happened right after that happened? After all those guys from jail, they're not really doing their DDoS anymore. So what do you get? You get a bunch of copycats coming in. They're gonna they're gonna sit there and capitalize on that name, uh, all the notoriety that that uh, the big DDoS boys were really could really shut down your network and, and ground and pound you. They're sitting there showing shoving show, phishing emails out to everyone saying, "Hey, if you don't pay us, we're gonna DDoS." 
DDoS. We're going to shut you down. They didn't do a little show of force DDoS. They didn't do anything to you at all because they might not even have the capability to do it. But these people made hundreds of thousands of dollars in Bitcoin just by scaring people who weren't being sharp enough to go ahead and check out that threat to see if the gangsters who were in the room could actually break their legs or not because you can't see this threat. It's just the email coming to you saying, hey, you know, here's this big name and we have an email address that looks kind of like it because we have our modded collective with the name. Hey, it's basic. But, you know, like I said, they made, a, they made tons of money off of that. All right? Um, so the big thing now, you can't have a talk without talking about ransomware. Even uh, Eric O'Neill's keynote this morning uh, about espionage gets into ransomware, right? It, it's, uh, it's crippling everything. It's just another um, extension of extortion. It's just another thing. Sending out macro uh, viruses and Word documents over the email, drive by, downloads with exploit kits, hitting you with every kind of ransomware there is. There's like 140 different strains of ransomware last time I looked. Uh, why? Because it's super, super, duper profitable. Um, you don't have to sit there and spider your way through a network, find the crown jewels, spend weeks and weeks, uh, have to be a network genius and, and figure out a network to, to get in and, and find the good stuff down the database. And then you have to fence it. You have to have a buyer who wants that information. You know, you know the whole underground economy of buying and selling credit card numbers or personal information. Boom! I, I just shut you down. You pay me, and, I, and I'll let your stuff go. Right? That's a uh, that's where a lot of thing is now. We're going to talk about some of the newer evolutions of that in a bit. Here's one of my favorite new trends in electronic extortion, especially with some of the super fun data breaches we had last year with things that might be a little bit more embarrassing to people, right? Adult Friend Finder, Brazzers, Ashley Madison, Penthouse, Fur Affinity. I had to Google that. <laughs> when I saw the, uh, when I saw the uh, data breach stuff come up. But you know, hackers getting in, getting, uh, getting these databases, post them up online, put them out on Facebook and stuff like that, right? But then every Joe Schmo who can sit there and spin up a, uh, a, a phishing server, um, starts sitting there spamming out everyone whose email addresses is in that, that database, saying, hey, if you don't pay me, I'm going to contact your friends, I'm going to contact your family. You see some of these same emails that are sitting right here. Send me this Bitcoin address or I'm going to ruin your life because your information is in Ashley Madison databases and this and that. And I'll tell you another thing, it wasn't just people's personal information, it was people at big banking institutions, government, military, made up a huge percentage of email addresses in these database dumps. For me and you personally, if you're going to join an adult friend finder or Ashley Madison, man, get a Hushmail account or something, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't you need to use your mill.gov, uh, <laughs> my employer email address to really do that the other day. Man, just, just, uh, just a little bit of offset for yourself personally. Uh, whatever you're into in life is fine. But, uh, anyways, people are paying through the nose on this because that's, that's not just my, my Word documents and things are locked up. This is, I'm going to ruin your life and I actually have the capability of doing it if I do a little bit of, uh, Open source research. I mean, your email address is everywhere, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. The next kind of cool thing going on with uh, extortion now too is uh, um, like the Mossack Fonseca, the Panama Papers. Anyone follow that? Where there's like this big, nasty, terrible law firm um, that sat there and handled uh, making shell companies for people to launder money, right? So they had all the all the, all the papers about this stuff. Um, and this guy, group, um, a guy claimed to bring credit for it, but the, you know, groups out there hacked this law firm because um, they were using, I forget, was it a, a, a crummy WordPress plugin or something they had uh, on their site, popped in a uh, web shell, got in, dug around, found all the good information, and got it out, and, and blew this wide open about all this uh, information about these people, huge government people that were, uh, that were laundering money probably, you know, stealing money from their country, the, you know, uh, their dictatorship style, style country and stuff like that. Um, the other screenshot over there is uh, a little more close to home to, to all of us. Uh, a guy called the Dark Overlord who likes to hack into healthcare companies, dentists, and stuff like that, get the database of customers, and then uh, start sending email messages. You can see the sample up there. Sends email messages to the, uh, the victim uh, corporation, Doctor, officer, where says, "Hey, I got all this information. Here's a screenshot of what your systems looked like from when I was in there and had my shell on it. Pay me, or I'm going to leak it 
a lot of stuff has been leaked by Dark Overlord. If you check out that name and start seeing some of the dumps where he's, he, he'll carry out his threats for sure. So that's harming you and me because our medical places aren't securing our stuff and then they're holding for ransom. What do you do if you're in that situation? You're in that dentist office and you're like the IT guy because they don't have a big Fortune 500 security uh, company and they're sitting there going, I've, been, I've seen the news where I'm not supposed to pay people who are demanding uh, money out of me. I, I, I don't want to pay. I, I shouldn't pay. I feel like that, you know. And then, then your information's out there. So that's a pretty cool extortion uh, trend that's really going on in the last uh, maybe year. Pretty new. So, like earlier, we had kind of the copycat people who were just capitalizing on a bad name for the DDoS uh, attacks or wanting to collect them and stuff like that, but they couldn't really carry out their threat. Now we have some kind of even more evil. We have ransomware that comes in and encrypts your files, and you pay, and they can't decrypt it. They don't actually have the keys going up to their server, so you pay, and your money just goes, I mean, you could have thrown it the wishing well. Um, you got kill this for a Linux, you have ran scam. Um, that came out last year, Kill This is a little newer, a little closer to my heart. Things that start hitting things like uh, Elasticsearch uh, instances that we're going to look at in a minute or start hitting the Linux uh, or, or this closer to my heart. But yeah, this stuff is locking up people's systems demanding payment. You pay, and well, thank you. You pay, and you still can't get your stuff back. That's terrible. And uh, this is more terrible. Like I said, ransom hits home for me. Um, and research started coming out, and December uh, 2016, uh, Victor Gevers, uh, Hex Dude, is uh, his Twitter handle. I follow the heck out of this guy now because uh, he's the one that really started seeing all of uh, the start off just being like MongoDB instances out of the internet. Uh, they would, uh, well, in the originally thought they were encrypting them um, and demanding payment. You just come in on your MongoDB. Is extended to Elasticsearch that you might have out in AWS Cloud or something like that. Uh, people's to do clusters that they might have for doing information security research. I mean, I know a lot of people have been affected by this one. Uh, their information security deal, maybe they should have been locking their instance down. And we're going to look at some things that you can do to not be that guy um, in a bit. But uh, people will pay and they can get their stuff back. Um, some security researchers have looked at uh, some honeypots they put up since this started happening a couple of months ago. And they capture some of the scripts that these guys are running. It's a very scripted attack. They're not they're not encrypting anything. Stuff comes on to an open uh, NoSQL instance, and it just deletes the files and it puts their stuff up there. It just deletes all the tables, puts up the one table with the ransom demand. You pay, you're not getting anything back. They, all they do is they delete your data. They sit there and encrypt your giant uh, one terabyte to do plus with all the research that you've been putting together for whatever you're working up in AWS. It's just gone. So all the money that these guys have made, uh, last time I looked was a couple of weeks ago, they made a, they made several hundred thousand dollars. And uh, they're just victimizing the heck out of people. So uh, yeah, don't, don't be extorted by people that can't carry out their threats. Make sure you're looking out for, um, you know, if, if you do find that you might want to comply with someone taking ransom, uh, make sure they can actually give you your stuff back. Here's another thing I think is super interesting, because I've been waiting for ransomware to extend beyond, you know, us trusting attackers to just give us our files back and not have something else super bad going on later on. Well, that's really starting to poke its head up more and more. Just last month, uh, the Cisco Talos researchers found some new variants of Locky. They're also delivering Trojans that stay in your system after you pay for the uh, ransomware come off. That's just a little uh, little TCP stream there that shows two different payloads. One's, one's a Locky ransomware. Others click, uh, click fraud Trojan that's still going to hang out in your system after your files are encrypted. So, you know, it keeps on giving. It's already starting up there. Uh, who knows what else is going to come in next? You know, whatever pays the bills, right? Um, this one's also pretty awesome, too. And uh, this is one of the things I've been kind of waiting for, uh, waiting to come and get a little more hot docksware. It's, man, it breaks everything. It's just a kitchen sink of ransomware. Not only is it going to encrypt your files and give you a countdown timer to start deleting them and being all evil and nasty, but it goes in and exfiltrates that data off your system. And uh, if you've got super sensitive stuff, you've got deep dark secrets, uh, they'll start leaking that data out online to try to entice you to pay the ransom, and that ransom is going to go up and up. So this is really about what, what I've been waiting to get really ugly in the world of uh, extortion ransomware. These things are much, much nastier sitting out there, right? So, now that we've talked about a lot of the bad and evil out there, uh, you know, and uh, 
I like that today that Eric O'Neill the uh, the keynote this morning talking about you know spying on people with the Internet of Things IP and cameras and stuff like that. You know, I can see that that coming for sure. Your uh, your driverless car that's pretty fun. I always have my eyes open for what's going to come next, right? Uh, with with online sourcing. So so what what do we know so far? History repeats itself. It's a it's a big cat and mouse game, right? Uh, Physical crime and cyber crime are not that much different than each other. Everything stays the same and everything changes. The motivations are the same, we're going to make money. The general how it works never really changes. It's what the techniques are that changes a little bit. Uh, we know that we need to make sure we know what we're dealing with when we have a threat that comes at us and how we can best protect ourselves from it. And uh, we know that even if we pay the bad guys to come at us, it, it might not even have enough foothold in it still or doing more damage to us. Uh, Google here has worked somewhere that has any kind of policy about ransomware at all, whether they're going to pay the ransom or whether they're, whether they're just going to tell them, you know, the bad guys to get out of town you know, if they don't negotiate with terrorists. Anybody working where that actually has a policy? A couple people? Everyone here else works somewhere that hasn't thought about what they're going to do if they get their files locked up? Because I've been in this huge discussion with customers before where they're like, Oh man, we can't do business at all. What should we do? I can't tell you what we should do. What is your maximum tolerable downtime to throw a CISPI term out there? You know, because everyone talks CISPI in the uh, in the incident response war room for companies. You know, what's your maximum tolerable downtime? Do you have backups? You know, well, this shouldn't be the first time you've thought about it, right? But speaking about that, if you have backups and this and that, my best idea is let's take away the hostage. If everyone's seen uh, the big Lebowski, that everyone remember the fact like Bunny Lebowski like just disappeared, and everyone thought she got kidnapped, and there's like people trying to get this ransom money back from the dude. And at the end, you know, she comes back on her own, and there's these German guys have been trying to get the ransom. They come and they're still they're they're setting the dude's car on fire. And I was like, man, what's up with you guys? She came back home. You don't have a hostage. You don't get a ransom. Without a hostage, there is no ransom. That's what a ransom is. <laughs> so, anytime I'm sitting there dealing with stuff, I always just have to think about that scene of Big Lebowski in the back of my mind. We can just take away the hostage, right? Take away the hostage. That's the first thing that we can do. Just have a backup, man. Have a backup. And, you know, maybe if you get hit and you have some other systems you can roll over to for redundancy, you can get your data back. But I tell you what, you got to make sure you have some offline backups too. Don't just have them sitting there, you know. Uh, whatever my net backup is, just going over the wire or whatever, whatever right? Because you have a couple of pretty, uh, pretty advanced type of ransomware threats. You, get, you got Crypto Fortress, which is cool. I mean, it comes over, it's not like APT advanced, it's just a little bit more advanced on how it works. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of others start following suit. They can encrypt unmapped shares, so if you just kind of browsed over uh, the share without actually mapping it as a drive, they can encrypt that too. It's looking for the, that SMB. Um, type stuff on your system, and as soon as it sit there, you've got SMB connection to it, and go ahead there and encrypt it. Samsung is actual uh, an attack group over in Eastern Europe that's responsible for this one. They're spending 45 to 60 days on your network. They're real hackers that are in there on your network, but they're just going to profit off a ransom because it's so quick and easy and profitable. They don't have to have a whole underground economy to deal with them, right? Um, that one shot that's up here on the screen is uh, a little bit of my timeline in my case I worked on. You see the application compatibility cache is showing some of the tools that were used. Uh, 64.eac is just meme cache, but you know, so they're in there, they're done with credentials, they're going to move around ladder and stuff like that. The other tool, CSPD, any, ad, any uh, system admins in here know what that one is? It's just a tool to sit there and map your active directory. That's the first thing they're doing. They're going to start mapping your network. They're going to start finding out where your terminal server uh, type stuff is, where your uh, where your backup servers are, and stuff like that. One of the last things we always see on this attack is them sitting there and going on uh, over terminal services sessions to your uh, backup servers and killing those right before they launch the uh, the, the malware out and all, all the other systems. Just using PS exec to sit there and encrypt all couple hundred servers that you have in your whole enterprise, they will bring you to your knees. Absolutely. Everything is touching a wire. So if you don't have an offline backup, these guys are going to hit you. They didn't put in a small amount of investment to come in and hit you. This wasn't a drive-by download uh, for, for a macro virus. They sat there and put time in to come in and lock you down. So when I see some of these uh, big 
Um, ransomware breaches on the news. This one's talking about it, phishing. Or like, I don't really think that's phishing. Uh, if you look at these past, this was a this was a web shell um, that these guys got in on. Right? The, they're uh, they're very popular, looking for JBoss uh, vulnerabilities. People that have unpatched JBoss. I'm sure they'll transition around to other stuff soon if they have it now. I just haven't seen a case yet. I mean, these are these are real hackers. They're just profiting big jobs and they're demanding huge ransoms. Of companies and organizations that they've actually brought to their knees all the way down to their backup service. So you have to have some online backup somewhere for uh or these threats are still gonna get you, right? Uh they they have gone all the way all the way to the core. Uh so even the ones that, that I'm not involved in working on see these huge sums of money that are demanded on ransom to come out in the news I'm like, that's probably the same same guys, because they've got the whole company and they know it, they know it, right? Um so, what's some simple things that we can do? I mean, security is simple, really, right? If we can just get everybody to do it, if we can just get all the users to deal with the stuff we need them to do, we can start tightening things down. Uh, Semantic just came out with a uh, little bit of research that wasn't too hard to believe. Like 95% of PowerShell scripts that they saw are malicious. You know, if you work in a company that has a thousand users, there's probably like five people who need to use PowerShell, right? Uh, what's Bob and accounting going to do with PowerShell? Is he PowerShell scripting the books? Um, you know what? What is what is what is Sue in the marketing office going to do with PowerShell? These these users do not need the full array of PowerShell ability on their endpoint. You can run your PowerShell stuff for IT admin stuff. How to all those endpoints without have them having full on PowerShell on the system? So just remove it. It's not necessary. And if you can't remove it, or you don't want to remove it. Most of these scripts are using ISA, which is the integrated scripting engine, or REPL, which is read, evaluate, print loop. So to sit there and look like base 64 encoding and kind of decode that, um, you can you can turn these things off in group policy. You can turn off ISA and, and, and REPL in group policy, and that's going to take away most of your malicious text. Because if anybody's seen malicious PowerShell scripts, it's not sitting there in a nice clean, plain text script saying, hey, uh, go and delete all your shadow copies and hey, do the, it's, all, it's all available to you if you have to de obfuscate. And REPL is what's just there and is that engine in PowerShell. It doesn't you turn off the root policy. Man, you will reduce your attack surface. And security is not always being the fastest gazelle, it's just not being the sickly gazelle, right? Um, so make them have to be a hunter to get you. Uh, you know, application whitelisting is hard. People who are doing application work, this is good for them. Eric and I'll talk about that this morning too. This is hard, and there are still things that are going to get around you for doing application whitelisting. There's there's malware that's going to inject into your whitelisted uh, application still too, so you're not completely reducing that threat. You've gone through a lot of trouble, but it's a good thing to do. It's going to keep uh, whatever just not even sophisticated malware from running on you, right? Uh, I remember three years, one that's kind of near and dear, close to my heart, we were talking about all the NoSQL instances that do and Elasticsearch get hit earlier. Uh, and don't have default credentials, well, you know, or have no credentials, don't just have an open instance sitting there going, bind, bind a home. If you're binding to 0, .0, .0, .0, .0 that's just saying, yeah, any, any IP address can come hit this and, and sit there and run stuff. Bind your, uh, your NoSQL to 1.7.0.1. You know, some of these really simple things. One of the more research, I got some links in this, and everybody can have this PowerPoint. Uh, Elastic has really good guidelines, not just for how you're going to secure your Elastic search engines, but it'll work for, for uh, the same guidelines that work for your Hadoop and, and Mongo and stuff as well. It's a lot of really pretty basic security stuff, right? Security is easy. Uh, if you're going to have yourself up in the cloud, AWS or whatever, build a security group that says what IP addresses can talk to what IP addresses. It's like a firewall ish in the cloud. If you're going to have multiple instances working together, or you have a group of people who are going to be working with your cloud instances, don't just leave that stuff open, man. You can sit there and go really easy and make a security group in AWS. And there's a link to um, just how easy that kind of stuff is. Um, endpoint solutions, you got to have something these days that's going to look at your command line arguments. I've put a few samples of command line arguments down there. If you just have, you know, I don't want to beat up on any vendors, but I will. Um, you know, things like, um, like McAfee or Semantic or whatever, it's just right signature based AD. It's not looking at command line arguments. It's sitting there looking for like heuristics and this and that and launches this or what kind of folks or whatever. Man, if, if you're malware, um, some things, not, not to have them too much, like Cisco AMP or like Bit9, some, you know, some things really good, uh, silence, some of these other things. They're looking at all these command line arguments that are coming out. 
and, and it seems, you know, something super simple like VSS admin, delete shadow, log file, you know, whatever. Uh, that's like one of the basic building blocks of what ransomware is going to do. It's going to sit there and delete your shadow copy so you can't restore your data from your volume shadow copy recording <laughs> encryption. This exact says, I don't know what this binary is, but I don't like it to try to do this. Um, some of these other things, you know, basic things like uh, going out to get the, uh, pull down the next station from the internet, this red server, dot 32 exe you know, that's, that's a pretty basic thing that, uh, that your malware is going to do to look at those command lines. you got to have one solution that can do that. Um, there, there are things, there are free things like Sysmon that can look at these command arguments, but it's not going to prevent it from happening. But if you run Sysmon and configure it up, you can at least investigate back what's been uh, maybe affected before something gets too bad, like some more dedicated attackers might be running around, right? Um, if you do find yourself a victim of ransomware, don't just pay up without thinking about it at all. There's a lot of ransomware decryptors out there now. Uh, NoMoreRansom.org is being a pretty good repository of all the publicly available ransomware decryptors that are out there now. I think there's, know, there's more than a dozen, but it's growing all the time. Keep that thing bookmarked. It's a really cool collaboration by a lot of companies um, right now to build that. So I'd be a ransomware to death. What about things that aren't ransomware, right? Uh, you know, we talked about some application wide listing, some of the disabling need of ports and services. You know, if you don't need a service, get rid of it. If a port doesn't need to be open, don't let it be. Don't have open telnet on your machine. And you don't have Mirai botnets running around. Uh, some of these kind of basic things like that, you don't have admin, admin as your password, or admin123 because you decided to be marked out and use some numbers. Um, <laughs> look at things like privilege account management and, and make sure you define your roles on, on network shares. You know what I mean? It, it, uh, average user Bob doesn't need to have access to the snapshots on the on the uh, network file share. Don't don't let Bob have access to that. If Bob's not the, the, the net backup guy or the IT person to restore, really sit there and define these things out. You know, like I said, if you have Sam Sam come in, you can figure out those snapshots for restoration on that server anyways, but just don't be the sickly gazelle for the really crappy malware that's gonna come wipe you out. But make sure those, those permissions are defined. You know, you can save yourself so much if you just don't be the safely gazelle. You know, the, the, we're not just thinking about the, the super ABT all the time. So we talked about DDoS um, extortion. That's still alive and well. It's even gotten way more alive and well than the rise that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Have a DDoS plan. When you're getting DDoS, don't make it be the first time that you and your company thought about DDoS. And not all DDoS is the same. I talk to people and so stuff. I got DDoS mitigation. I have an agreement with my ISP, if I get my link saturated, we're going to do this and that. Okay, that's great. One, you're already down by the time that happens. Two, who loves their phone company and gets immediate service from that comps? I've never had that ever. And don't think that they're any better when you're under DDoS and you're calling for the first time saying you want to deal with that, uh, uh, you know, link saturation DDoS mitigation plan that y'all made. And uh, pay attention to what the SLA is on that too, because that might not be how long you want to be down. But all DDoS is not the same. That one's going to help you out with your volume-based attacks at top. There's three main types of DDoS, right? And there's also the protocol attacks, like the, the kind of reflective DDoS things that's going to sit there and someone's spoofing your IP address and you're getting those Synax back and your firewall's happening to deal with that. We're just going to get a ton of Synax that came with that send coming from your network and your firewall's just going to get overloaded and confused and all be hit by that. That's not volume-based at all. Your ISP cannot help you with that. You're going to have to have a partnership with something else, you know, your, or some appliances or something on your network that can help you scrub this traffic, mitigate it, deal with it, start dropping it before it starts overloading your firewalls and putting you out of business. Uh, application attacks are going to sit there and shut down your web server. It's going to sit there and cycle out all your CPU or RAM and just bring that web server to its knees so you're no longer doing e-commerce business or whatever you do. It's going to sit there and have um, Post and get requests that cannot be completed and resolved. So your, your web servers sit there and they freak themselves out because they have so many requests that they cannot finish with. What's your ISP going to do for you for that? Nothing. Also, what are the partnerships and the appliances that you have for, for Radware or whatever going to do for you for that? Nothing. You're going to have to have other plans in place for those. You're going to have to know what kind of DDoS you're, uh, you're under attack from. Uh, right? And that's going to come having visibility into your network flows and what's coming in. And, Knowing what's going on with your web servers before they they die on you. Have you know if you have critical web servers, I mean you gotta get those things up on a dashboard somewhere besides just the Norse PPU map. I know everyone loves that one in their slot. 
Um, but I guess something up that has your CPU and memory load on some of your web servers, at least if you don't have some other kind of DDoS going on. I feel like I have to talk about Mirai for just a bit. Um, and the internet is terrible, is what I like to call IoT a lot. But uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that comes out of IoT. I really like my Nest thermostat and a lot of other cool things, you know. Um, I love IoT. I, you know, I, I like that my fridge will know what I want from the grocery store before I do someday. Um, but, you know, all, all these Mirai botnet type of DDoS attacks that, that came up, this came from really weakly secured devices. The uh, Dyn DNS attack that was huge in the news a few months ago, that, all the traffic was coming from baby monitors. Um, everyone loves Brian Krebs, right? And uh, the, the DDoS attack that shut down his, uh, his uh, blog, that's going off CCTV cameras that weren't secured. And that one actually scares me a whole lot. There's a lot of CCTV cameras out there so poorly secured that someone could be hacking into them and watching the whole world in this robot style. Um, they, they could be doing worse things and just send uh, put Mariah on to do these big DDoS attacks. But man, this has really opened up for huge ge geographically dispersed botnets for DDoS. It's so hard to track attribution where they come from. A lot of people's DDoS plans that I've talked to is like, well, I'm just going to geoblock Taiwan, you know, or whatever. Well, good luck with that with Mariah because it's coming at you from everywhere. It's coming at you heavy. And, uh, Mariah is in there, so there's a little bit of the source code in the screenshot, so it can be pretty on cute. Um, but it's, it's sitting there and it's shutting off Telnet SSH and ACT ports, so you can't remote into it to fix your devices after they've been uh, infected by the botnet. What could you do for that? Could you sit there and scan your own IoT devices to see if they don't have those ports listening? You can't build them anymore. You might have problems on your network that you can mitigate before your own uh, companies. Samsung smart TVs or whatever to give you the next uh, big bot in the news that is, uh, is actually attacking traffic or you get DDoS yourself internally or something like that, right? And uh, here's one thing I thought was cute in my uh, botnet uh, code. It's so you're using a dictionary of around 60 super weak passwords, which is less than the Morris worm in the 80s. Morris worm had more default passwords to deal with to sit there and spread out in the 80s than Mariah does because you know, your dictionary word list don't have to be that big. And, uh, you know, everybody can DDoS now. Everybody's seen uh, the DDoS as a service stuff and, and whatever get really popular, the, the DDoS uh, group that got arrested uh, a few months ago. I don't know if everybody followed that, but why is all this stuff out there? Those three dudes in Israel who had the DDoS stuff, they made $600,000 running out their DDoS infrastructure for like a six month period that they were able to track. Dude, that's profit. They had to do anything but had a botnet built out and ran it out to, to you to, to dodge your company because you're mad and you got fired or whatever, whatever your reason was. Um, so I said, have, have a DDoS game plan. Be able to know what type of DDoS traffic you're having. If it's coming in, what systems are crashing, use some net flow, system resource monitoring, check out your firewall traffic and loads, um, have some dashboards around that, have a plan for blocking and dropping that. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, uh, yeah, I, if you have visibility into your net flow, wherever you work, you're going to be better equipped to be able to deal with DDoS, but you're going to be way better able equipped to investigate a breach or anything else. As small as net flow is, man, everybody would have visibility in their net flow and know what's going on with that. Um, that that's the best way to turn scope uh, an incident as well as deal with your DDoS problems. Um, if, if you have some type of extortion thing that you've been a victim of too. Man, start with Google, look around. If you got our money collector or lizard squad email and you didn't at least Google to see that uh, that's a big threat, that's bad on you for being one of the people that paid, uh, I think, $100,000 for the fake uh, Armada collective people. Um, $150,000 in Bitcoin went to the fake lizard squad people. Don't be that sickly gazelle. Go Google if you got that email and you'll, you'll win. Because that was out immediately. Um, another thing that's pretty cool is, is now all of the, uh, all the ransom camps are paid in Bitcoin, right? Um, chain analysis is one of, uh, of a few tools you can sit there and you can follow the money, you can follow that Bitcoin wallet, see who's paying. This is powerful in a lot of ways. You can see if anybody's paying, or if it might be bogus, or you can see if it could be like a targeted thing towards just you. Uh, a special Bitcoin wallet just for you that hasn't had any money to go to it, but you know you have problems, that could be a sign that you could have bigger problems than you think you have if someone's got trouble making a, a wallet just for you. So following that, uh, it, you know, follow 
all the money is a, is a good little piece of advice out there. So a little bit deeper into Intel too, uh, whatever kind of industry you're in, there's probably an information uh, sharing uh, community for you, right? MSI stack for, uh, for state government type employees, FSI stack for financial, uh, RSIS for retail food services and whatever, so people can talk about whatever kind of threats are facing you. Uh, in your industry specifically, sharing malware indicators, sharing other kind of indicators of compromise, and just trying to stay ahead of your threats a little bit. Uh, and you know, if you're not in those industries, you can get on with the My Fred Intel project. Check that out. Or you can pay tons of money to one of the bazillion of Fred Intel vendors that are right now. They'll, they'll give you fees and give you information too. But one of the super awesome things about ISACs is, you know, you can share information about what's happening to you, and that can be enriched a little bit about what might uh, be known about another angle of that from another company, one of your peers out there said, hey, you know what, I saw those like, IP addresses, I saw those tools, but here I saw this kind of too. Or, you know, here they went off these other these other IP addresses after that, and we saw this kind of tunnel going, oh, you know what, let me look for that. So, you know, you had that collaborative mentality into it. So, you know, once your walls are high enough with, with AV and firewalls and whatever, <coughs> threats are really going to get to you. In, in one of three ways, right? They're going to come to you through phishing emails and stuff like that. You're going to get social engineered some other way, or you're going to pop with a web shell because you got a web service some kind of vulnerability, right? Um, and phishing by far is the biggest, the biggest avenue that's taken by everybody these days. So, man, why don't we use that phishing quarantine data for our advantage? Anyone mining their phishing quarantine? Your, your, yeah. Awesome. One, one person. Go ahead. Yeah, that's why ports would work. That way, I can sell zero days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But uh, I tell you what, if you mine your phishing quarantine data to get the names or subjects, the body of that email, the attachments and stuff like that, you can do several things with it. One, if you're doing like your own uh, uh, security awareness program there, you can make your stuff more realistic, look like the, the threats they're facing out there right now too, right? There's some other things though. This is a this is a little Splunk diagram up here of three different infections, a couple loggies and a and a dire or you pay. You see those little connectors in the middle? There are some of my employees who are getting hit with all of them. Why? I don't know why. But I want to go dig a little further in, right? Maybe I don't know why now, though I don't know why I might first set that diagram up there so they're gonna link those things. Another thing that can be super interesting is if you start bucketing. These users that you see getting a lot of phishing or malware type things, or if it's something more exotic and locky, you know, there's some key logging malware or something like that. Let's bucket these employees. Are all these people working on a deal together? Are they working on merger and acquisition stuff? Um, could there be someone from the merger and acquisition that's targeting that? This has been the news a few times where, uh, you know, one of them I can remember right now is the Chinese government had uh, some people under surveillance um, with some malware that were working on uh, negotiations with uh, the Chinese government over something. You know, why do I have these users in this little bucket here who are getting the same kind of malware, the same kind of phishing stuff? What might I want to dig into there? Could I have an active threat in my environment right now that's bigger than that, now that I know that these users in this bucket over here are dealing with that? Or could there be data that just have been breached or part of a dump because the company that they're working on deal with, that company's been full on compromised. Could I reach out to someone over there or work with some of my security peers somewhere else? Use this phishing quarantine data. It's sitting there. You have some kind of um, some kind of device sitting there catching that, catching your, your phishing stuff coming into you. I mean, that's that's real threat intel. That's not just some feed or junk coming in. I throw it in. And I get alerts, you know, for for grizzly stuff that has, you know, you know, check check my IP dot org. That is one of the indicators for some kind of junk. It's just false alerts stuff. This is sitting there and it's sitting there using. My analyst brings and they say, I got a problem. What can my problem be? If I bucket my people out for different ways, different groups, different deals, different activities, could I have a big deeper threat hanging on? Uh, anyhow, that is about it for me. How do I do on time? I did all right. Go for it. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions or uh, anything like that? No? All right. Oh, oh there's one. Go ahead, sir. I'm going to throw it at you. Um, I'll walk out there with a the microphone. I'm like, hold on to you. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm old now. Everyone. Uh, <laughs> Hung Wai Men. Anybody ever heard of him before? What's that? Hung Wai Men. How do you mend? Hung Wai Men. Hung Wai Men? 
I don't know. How, how do you think? He's uh, mentioned in the mandate report. Uh, he's also the newly elected head of the poll. Oh. So, um, anybody see a conflict? Yeah, that, that sounds that sounds pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, basically, um, the uh, press said uh, it was going to be um, last presence or uh, former leader left this way. Um, that uh, nobody in the state or anything objected from it. But uh, yeah, he's had a bit of a so if you are international and working with them, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, So, um, yeah, the uh, Homeland is probably the average home school of adults running it. Um, the, um, you're probably going to come up where Ralph Ruffin is going to call it. That's interesting, yeah. So, uh, someone who is heading Interpol now named that. Mean in ABC one report. I guess uh, that could that could leave a scary twist on uh, on Interpol. That they probably won't be taking down any big uh, Chinese botnet actors or espionage. They're not going to be digging up the OPM breach people, probably. That's what you're saying? Uh, we are one of those wonderful stuff. Uh, <laughs> okay. Only my DNA sequence to that. Yeah. Um, that uh, basically it's uh, bottom bottom line. Interpol can't trust any longer. Don't trust anyone. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.